Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shaw, and I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined today by Commissioner Gene Lambrew, the Commissioner of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Lambrew and I are here to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine. I'd like to start off today's update by marking the endpoint of National Nurses Week. Though definitely not the end of our continuing appreciation for nurses overall, I wanted to take a second to note the importance of all the work that MAID nurses have been doing throughout the COVID-19 crisis and even before that and the work that they'll be continuing to do after. We continue to thank them for being on the front lines of the front lines of the healthcare workforce every single day. By putting the, the, the entire community above themselves, they have continued to keep all Maine people safe and healthy. I kicked off this week of appreciation for nurses with a nod toward one of the founders of modern public health nursing, Florence Nightingale. But today, I'd like to cap off National Nurses Week with a shout out to probably one of the most influential nurses of all time, certainly of the past 200 years, Dorothea Dix. Dorothea Dix, among, any, among many things, was herself a Mainer. She was born in Hamden in 1802, and starting around the 1840s, began her career of tireless advocacy. She was a champion for the indigent mentally ill. This was at a time before the Civil War, when neither group received much of any attention, let alone the souls, the individuals who were at the intersection of both suffering from poverty as well as mental illness. By the end of her career, Dorothea Dix founded 32 hospitals. She's one of these individuals who, if we didn't have proof that she existed, many, with, many of us would have doubted that someone like her could have even walked the earth. If she were here today, she would undoubtedly share our concerns around health equity as it relates to COVID-19, as well as the potential mental and behavioral health concerns that can arise out of isolation related to COVID-19. But among the many amazing stories of Dorothea Dix, the one that stands out to me is the fact that she herself was a pioneer in emergency preparedness. She visited the British colony, the then British colony of Nova Scotia in 1853 to study, for, to, to study the care that Nova Scotia was providing to individuals suffering from, mentally Ill, from mental illness. During that visit, she traveled to Sable Island to investigate reports of mistreatment um, and abandonment among patients who had mental illness. It turns out that those reports were largely unfounded. But while she happened to be on Sable Island, she assisted in the rescue of a shipwreck while she was there. And she was concerned by the lack of preparedness on the island for future shipwrecks. And so when she returned to Boston, she led a successful campaign to send upgraded life-saving equipment back to Sable Island. The day after her supplies arrived, there was a shipwreck on the island. And because of her work, 180 people were saved. So among her many contributions to public health, to poverty reduction, to social justice, to mental illness, she happened to be a pioneer in emergency preparedness. We take a moment today to honor her work and honor all of the nurses across the state of Maine who are helping us with today's work. Overall, across the state, there have been no new deaths since yesterday, and Maine CDC is reporting 1,477 confirmed cases of COVID-19, an increase of 15 cases since yesterday. Of those, 1,338 are laboratory confirmed, and 139 are probable cases. Overall, there have been 202 individuals now who have been hospitalized at some point, 
and currently 34 individuals are in the hospital, 17 of whom are in intensive care units. Eight individuals remain on ventilators across the state. Overall, 913 individuals have recovered, an increase of 41 since yesterday. And at present, there, have been, there are 323 of our total number of cases who are among healthcare workers. There are also no new outbreaks in any facilities to report today. I'd also like to provide everyone an update on a recent shipment of a drug called remdesivir that the state of Maine just received. This past Saturday, Maine CDC was officially notified that the state, as well as a number of other states, would be receiving a shipment of, in our case, 10 cases of a drug called remdesivir. You might have heard about this drug. A recent study conducted by the National Institute of Health showed that it had the potential to benefit patients who were suffering from COVID-19, especially those who were severely ill. The 10 cases that Maine CDC is slate, was slated to receive would be enough to treat approximately 50 patients. Yesterday evening, the United States Department of Health and Human Services informed Maine CDC that the shipment of drugs for Maine would be arriving to our warehouse this morning. This morning at about 11 a.m., it did arrive, and within one hour, it was placed on transport vehicles for distribution to hospitals across the state. In fact, just as we were walking in, we heard that at least one of those hospital systems had already received their shipment of this drug. This is a situation where time is of the essence. We know from hearing from physicians across the state that there are critically ill patients in ICUs across the state that physicians would like to start using this drug on. That's why we were prepared to receive the drug, put it on the transport vehicles, and ship it out as soon as we received it. As a result of this quick action, doctors in Maine hospitals today have a new tool in order to use, in order to treat patients who are critically ill and suffering from the most severe symptoms of COVID-19. I'd like to thank all of our staff who were involved in receiving the shipment, loading it, and transporting it, as well as to healthcare providers in Maine who now have this additional tool to use. I'd also like to provide an update on the Tall Pines outbreak at the Tall Pines facility in Waldo County. Yesterday, we hit something of an epidemiological milestone. The outbreak at Tall Pines was originally opened on April 8th. Yesterday, actually now today, it has now been 18 days since the last individual there had their onset of symptoms and had a positive test. 18 days, well beyond the typical incubation period of 16 days that Maine CDC uses. In addition to there not having been any new cases now for 18 days, yesterday, the last staff member at Tall Pines was released from isolation. Overall, this outbreak was quite significant and sad for all of us who work in public health and healthcare across the state, to say nothing of the family members and staff themselves who were affected by it. Overall, 32 residents tested positive and 13 residents passed away. In addition, 11 staff members tested positive for COVID-19 as well. We hope that these positive trends continue and that there are no new cases that are reported. However, Maine CDC continues its engagement with Tall Pines and we continue to look for the possibility of new cases. However, this epidemiological milestone suggests that coupled with quick action, the best scientific public health advice available can help bring a difficult outbreak situation to one that can be resolved. I'd also like to provide a quick update on our continued efforts to fit test individuals across the state of Maine. Overall, working with our colleagues at the National Guard, 
About 465 healthcare workers across the state have been fit tested in order to in order to allow them to use an N95 mask. The National Guard's work has not yet been completed, however, and there are still an approximate 725 individuals left on their docket in order to receive this fit testing work. And we again thank our colleagues at the National Guard for undertaking this joint effort to get as many individuals and healthcare workers across the state fit tested. Finally, I'd like to just provide some updates on our distributions of PPE. Yesterday alone, 35 orders of PPE comprising over 20,000 pieces of PPE were delivered to healthcare facilities across the state. About 60% of those orders went to congregate care facilities like nursing homes, and about a third went to locally based fire, rescue, and EMS. Today, we're continuing our PPE distribution, and there are 31 orders in queue that are currently being delivered across the state. I'd like to now turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew for updates from the Department of Health and Human Services. Great. Thank you so much. So today, the Mills Administration launched a special campaign to remind Maine people of their health insurance options, especially in the face of COVID-19. As we know, many of our residents and our neighbors and our friends have lost their income, maybe lost their jobs, and maybe lost their health insurance, struggling to pay for the cost of premiums in these difficult times. As such, we are going to launch a major campaign statewide using digital, social media, and TV advertisements to remind people of the affordable options that are there for them. CoverMe.gov, or C-O-V-E-R-M-E.gov, is our resource to find out whether or not you can find affordable private insurance or Medicaid called MainCare. For people in Maine, if your income is below 51000 for a single person or 103000 for a family of four, may be eligible either for private insurance through healthcare.gov or MainCare. As a reminder, the first day the governor took office, Governor Mills directed the department to expand Medicaid or Main Care. That has made it possible for, as of May 1st, 53,036 people to be covered with the federal government paying for 90% of their cost. But because of these challenging times, that number is increased. It rose by 11.5% since April 1st alone and by over nearly 10,000 since January. We know that people need health care now more than ever. They may need it to get treated for COVID-19, to get that health care that they put off as we were in our stay-at-home period of the crisis. They may also need it for substance use disorders or mental health challenges that have been exacerbated by this crisis. We urge all Mainers to look at CoverMe.gov or to call 1-800-965-7476 to find out about their options. Additionally, yesterday we announced that we are implementing a program to ensure that people who are uninsured can get a COVID-19 test without paying for it. The cost of this test will be paid for by the federal government and the, there's a simple two-page form that people need to fill out for, that will allow them to get this covered coverage between March 18th and the end of the public health emergency. What this means is that cost of the test for COVID-19 is not a barrier for any resident of the state of Maine. It's covered if you're on Medicare, Maine care, private insurance, and now with this new policy, if you're uninsured. We urge all residents of Maine to really look at their own health care needs, talk to their health care providers, and seek health care as we move into this stage two, where we are with uh, protective personal protective equipment safety practices in our different health care settings provide the care that people need in Maine thank you great thank you commissioner uh, we will now turn things over to our colleagues in the media today's first question goes to Joe Lawler from the Press Herald yes hi thanks for uh, taking our questions today uh, a cu couple of questions uh, one for Dr. Shaw one for uh, Jean Lambrew um, I guess the first question is about the, 
the reopening of schools, potential reopening of schools, is there any thought to um, having students screened in some way, maybe temperature checks like you've seen seen at uh, restaurants uh, um, or any other type of, of screening? And, and then for, uh, for Jean Lambrew, uh, there's been, as you know, a lot of complaints from dentists about uh, not having a, a date to uh, reopen for routine care. Is there any, is there any progress on that front? Um, most states have either reopened or will be reopening very shortly. So I'll, I'll start with the school piece, and then the commissioner may want to weigh in on both of those. Yep. Uh, so as to the schools, uh, Joe, right now, uh, all, all discussions, are, all options are on the table. We're having a lot of discussions with our colleagues at the Department of Education about the, the, the most robust way to both think about opening schools, but obviously do so in a manner that preserves student safety and, and, and health above all else. Uh, there's a lot of discussions. Some of them involve engineering, uh, the ways that desks are spaced, things of that nature. Some of them involve things like temperature checks. It, it's probably at this stage too early to say exactly what schools may look like. Uh, the Department of Education has really been leading those discussions. Uh, we'd certainly welcome your opportunity to chat with them as well, and we're happy to refer your question over to them. But rest assured, the public health piece of that discussion is one that has not been lost. Sure. And I will just add that we continue to work with our different departments on that kind of guidance, mm -hmm. having Maine CDC participate, but also the stakeholders. We know principals, teachers, parents all have a role to play in what is safely reopening. So mm -hmm. we look forward to that engagement. Mm -hmm. On the question about dental services, we at the department care as much about dental services as all other health care services. We know oral health is critical to people's my mental health, physical health, and just their well-being. With that in mind, we have continued to look at guidance. The U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention had on April 27th continued to recommend that people postpone all but non-urgent dental care. We have been persistent in trying to ask if that guidance, guidance is going to be updated. Today, the director of the U.S. CDC said that the CDC will be updating that guidance on dental services. As such, Maine, C Maine Department of Health and Human Services looks forward to that guidance. If that guidance hasn't been issued by Monday, May 18th, the department will defer to the American Dental Association and the Maine Dental Association's guidance on that topic. I would underscore though, and your story highlighted some of these stories, we've heard them as well, from the beginning, Governor Mills, the department, Dr. Shaw and I have urged people, if you have an urgent need for dental or mental health or physical health care, get that care because that was never shut down during the emergency. Some of the stories that we're hearing about today, that is urgent care. So we do not want people to wait. If you have a toothache, you have an abscess, you have a cracked tooth, you should see your dentist because that type of care is open today. Great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we'll turn next to Megan from WMTW. Hi, thank you for taking my questions. I actually have two, one for Commissioner Lambrew and one for Dr. Shaw. The one for Commissioner Lambrew might be pretty quick, so I'll ask that first. Um, with the launch of CoverMe.gov uh, Cover or the website that will um, expand health care coverage to people or have them reassess or assess what their coverage is, do we have any idea how many more people in the state that might insure? Meaning, is there any way to quantify how many people you think could theoretically be getting coverage this way? Yeah, so the department hasn't done its own estimates, but recently we've seen organizations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation produce estimates on what might be happening both with the COVID-19 pandemic and what has been the limitations put on activity in the past few months, as well as the longer term economic challenges that the state and the nation face, those numbers are pretty daunting, it's significant. So as we are both trying to help people now ensure that they get the health care that they need, we are also planning for the future to make sure the state of Maine can provide that kind of coverage to low income people. And as a reminder, the federal government pays for 90% of the cost of anybody covered in the main care or Medicaid expansion. The federal government also increased its share 
of cost of people in Medicaid throughout the state of Maine. So currently 70% of all the cost of those people's care is federally funded. So we do keep an eye on what those projections might be. We want to make sure that people in Maine get their health care coverage, but we also are mindful of the fact that there may be more people who are turning to look for help for needed health care in the coming months. Great. And Megan, you had a question for me as well? I did, yeah. Um, thanks, Dr. Shaw. My question is about the efficacy of remdesivir. I've kind of heard, you know, uh, maybe even anecdotally, but read also two things that one is showing promise and two, you know, not really. Can you speak to how how you feel um, it, how effective it is? And because, I mean, if you're saying that, you know, the doctors now have a new tool, I would assume that means you believe that there is some measure of hope that uh, comes along with remdesivir. Can you expand on that? Sure thing. So Megan asks about what the data tell us around the efficacy, the benefit of remdesivir. And Megan, the first thing to note is that right now, where we are in COVID-19, the data are still being the, the data are still being done. The science is still underway. Uh, there are, however, a couple of studies that have been completed, and these are studies that meet the minimum criteria for being what we would consider to be useful. They were randomized. They were done in a high quality fashion. One of them was actually done by the National Institutes of Health uh, under the direction of, among other people, Dr. Fauci himself. And that study where, which Dr. Fauci talked about a week or two ago, showed that the rate of recovery on, on really ill patients who were taking remdesivir improved. Uh, it improved in a statistically significant way. But that same study also looked at whether the individuals who passed away on remdesivir versus a placebo were the same. And they found that there was a slight difference, a slight improvement with remdesivir, but not a statistically significant one. There are other trials that are underway right now across the country to try to get a better handle on what the data are and what the full promise of remdesivir might be. Maybe there's another drug out there that needs to be coupled with it. Maybe it needs to be administered in a different format. There's a lot of science that's going on right now to try to get a better handle on that. But right now, based on the data we've got, remdesivir is the one drug that the FDA has approved and has shown some benefit. However, however much we think of that benefit as good or bad, certainly there is some data now to suggest that it has activity. And that's why, given that we have heard from hospitals across the state that they had critically ill patients and that other than supportive care, there weren't other FDA-approved treatments out there, we wanted to expeditiously, as quickly as possible, get the drug out to doctors so that they could start using it. Uh, the data are still coming in, and we'll continue to keep tabs on those, but we didn't want to be holding on to the drug in our warehouse, knowing that there are patients in ICUs right now that could potentially benefit from it. Once all the science is in, we'll have a better sense of the true efficacy, but right now, we wanted to get it into the hands of doctors ASAP. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Brian Sullivan over at WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, Dr. Fauci testified today that a vaccine is likely a long way out. Uh, you touched on it a little bit with your first question in terms of Maine schools, but I guess at this point, do you think that Maine is would be on pace to reopen schools in the fall, and what would that look like? Uh, so I'll comment on the vaccine piece, but on the school piece, um, we'll, 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 we'll chat about that in a second, Brian, but you're right. Dr. Fauci earlier today, just a few hours ago, did provide an update to the Senate with respect to where things stand on a vaccine. Uh, he repeated where, what he has said for quite some time, which is that although vaccine development is moving at light speed, we're still some ways out. Uh, I think he said at least a year, if not longer. Uh, again, the science is still underway. Now, the possibility of any vaccine being made available for the school year, it's difficult to say. I think that's why any discussions around school openings will not only have to involve discussions about how we think about hours and, and engineering controls like staggered spaces, but also, as Commissioner Lambrew noted, making sure we're getting input from the schools themselves, from the teachers themselves, and from the parents, uh, because they're going to have an important role to play and a voice that needs to be heard. Sure, and I will just add that 
the governor's plan to for restarting Maine's economy has four stages. We are in stage one. We're relatively early in this, and we are going to progress through this with evidence, with best practices, with engagement with our different partners. Certainly, the Department of Education is part of that, working with its stakeholders, but we're working with all Maine sectors because we know Right now, the urgency is what are we doing this month and into June? We are continuing to look at our data, to look at our testing capacity, to look at our PPE, to figure out are we ready to progress through those stages? We might be able to accelerate that as we did last week with the rural reopening of the retail and the restaurant sectors, but we may need to roll back. And so we are trying to be mindful of the evidence as we proceed. Uh, I'm going to turn. Ask one more question, Dr. Shaw. Yeah, sure. Go, go ahead, Brian. Uh, I believe you might have touched on this a little bit yesterday, but I think if my math is right, you 41 more people recovered today. I guess if you yes. could expand a little bit on the work that's being done with those patients that have recovered and any concerns that there might be in terms of uh, long-term effects as a result of the virus. Great. Uh, so Brian's, Brian's last question is around recovery. Uh, first, Brian, uh, to be recovered means that you've met the U.S. CDC's gra criteria for being recovered, which says you have to have had no symptoms for a certain number of days after you first started feeling bad. And Maine CDC's epidemiologists are contact tracers. The contact tracers touch base with every single positive case from time to time to see how they're doing. And it's the contact tracers that make the final call as to when someone has met the criteria for recovery. Uh, now, you are, you're asking about the long-term effects. And given where we are right now, uh, only a couple of months after the virus, virus first arrived in the United States, uh, and just a couple of weeks after it's first arrived in Maine, any data around long-term effects of the virus are premature. But we, as well as our colleagues in the other 49 states and big cities, are trying to keep tabs on patients to try to get at least an epidemiological sense of any long-term effects. But really, it won't be until there are properly conducted randomized trial or uh, uh, blinded trials that we're able to get a better sense of any long-term effects. And those data, again, as kind of the theme for today, the science is still being done on that, whether it's around remdesivir, vaccines, or long-term effects. Uh, there's still a lot of science that we need to learn about. Uh, I'm gonna turn over to Amy Brown at WERU. And thank you, Dr. Shaw. My first question is for you, and then I also have one for Commissioner Lambrou. Uh, Susan Collins at today's Senate hearings asked about, uh, she said she'd been contacted by two hospital systems in the state of Maine who were asking about how uh, allocations would be made moving forward, specifically about remdesivir. And then she also said that uh, distribution is unclear as the timeline. And she wondered about allocations and distribution of treatments and vaccines moving forward, if there was any kind of system for that. Are, are, and, and the uh, FDA commissioner responded that things are being made, based, decisions are being made based on data and need. Are we experiencing any difficulties with getting any supplies into the state currently, or is it just a matter of confusion about whether or not a system's in place or how it works moving forward? Uh, so Amy, uh, your question is specific to remdesivir, is that correct? Well, not just remdesivir. She actually, uh, Susan Collins yeah. at today when she was asking the question, expanded it out to any treatments or vaccines that may be in the pipeline moving forward and whether or not there was a system to make sure that things were fairly distributed across the state. So I'll start and then turn it over to the commissioner. You know, we, we have, both Commissioner Lambrou and I are in very frequent contact with our counterparts in the federal government, as well as our counterparts in other states. Um, we, we've been able to get information in terms of what's coming into Maine, uh, how it would be allocated, uh, and, and what the expected delivery dates might be. We have been able to get that information because of the close contacts that we maintain in those situations. It does vary greatly whether we're talking about test kits versus drugs. Uh, and, and certainly we would, the more assistance we can get from the federal government, whether it's in supplies or in clarity around timelines, the better able that we can prepare at the state side. Um, but Commissioner, I'll turn it over to sure. you. Sure, I will just add that we, Governor Mills has said previously an opinion that I share, which is we recognize the fact that the federal government has often prioritized hotspots 
we get that. That is where people have the intense needs that might demand more supplies. All that said, we need in Maine the testing, the capacity, the treatment, so we don't become a hotspot. We are in a position where we can prevent the kind of rapid spread and overwhelming of the hospital and healthcare system that has happened in different states. So we have been at the table kind of talking about the needs of Maine, talking about our plans, trying to explain how we are, with Dr. Shaw's leadership, smartly trying to ensure we're protecting the people of Maine while, as we move into these stages, begin to figure out how to re-engage. So we are always trying to ensure that the allocation is not just based on where is the problem today, but how do we prevent the problem tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And Amy, I think you had, you had a separate question for Commissioner Lambrew as well. Yeah, but thank you. We get lots of questions from people who are, they believe the guidance about wearing face coverings and physical distancing, but they're concerned when they get out in the community and they're seeing rising number of people who believe for whatever reason that they don't need to wear those and they're not respecting the personal distancing or some of the other guidelines. So one of the most recent ones we got was from a listener who said she's aware of a business that's opening up despite the fact that their employees can and have been working from home, they're starting to require that the employees return back to the workplace. And uh, her question was, isn't the guidance that that's not supposed to happen until at least July 1st under the governor's order, which I believe is correct. And then secondly, what kind of recourse, and this is what a lot of my questions have come down to, is what kind of recourse do the workers have if they're in these situations and they feel it may be unsafe or uh, even if they feel like the conditions are safe if it's in violation of the governor's orders what do they do about that sure and i am going to provide a general general answer primarily because there is department of labor law and other types of laws that are specific to the case that you just described but turning to the philosophy the approach that the governor has taken with the staged planning that we have here in maine it really is assume that we're staying safer at home because the baseline is as we begin to act mm -hmm. to make sure that we're doing so deliberately and not too fast and not in an unsafe way. We provided checklists through the Department of Economic and Community Development, guidelines through the Department of Health and Human Services for health care organizations, graduation guidance through the Department of Education. But all that guidance is not a regulation, it's not a you shall open up and under these circumstances. It is guidance for safety. We know that some main businesses are not ready. They can't actually meet these checklists. Mm -hmm. They may want to take that time. Others are eager to reopen. We are not forcing any companies to reopen. It is a voluntary activity. We are providing them with the tools, the information, the support to do so. But going back to kind of the bottom line, and the governor said this the other day, especially when it comes to businesses, the best way to ensure that those businesses are following these guidelines is to, you know, vote with your feet. If you see a restaurant or a store that is not mm -hmm. complying with these practices, if you don't go there, they may come into line. But mm -hmm. we do have our systems of letters, other gradual ways to enforce things that we will use as needed. But we are hoping that Maine businesses and Maine citizens protect themselves, protect each other. Great. Well, people who the workers don't know those Department of Labor laws and they obviously can't vote with their feet from their jobs right now. Is this, if we continue to see the numbers rise as we're reopening, is the state considering putting anything in place for workers to get in touch if they're concerned or to, uh, you know, not have to go research the laws, but maybe have some experts that they can report things to and uh, express concerns about situations to? Sure. Well, first on the specifics, I imagine that there is information um, for workers at our Department of Labor website. Mm -hmm. We will get that to you via Robert Long. Thank you, Robert. But second, I'm going to take the optimistic view that Maine people ha have largely voluntarily com complied with even more aggressive measures in the past few months. As a reminder, we are now in a phase where we're able to do more as a state, do, do more as a community, safely with physical distancing, with precautions. But we are past the most rigid of our requirements. And even during that most rigid time, we were so proud of the fact that our residents, our family members, our friends stepped up to the plate. So 
I hope that we don't need to get to a point where we need some sort of formal system like you recommend. But at this point, we'll make sure that there is some clear information um, for workers as needed. Great. Thanks, Amy. We're going to turn next to Brad Rogers at WGME. Uh, hi, thanks so much. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, first, for Commissioner Lambrew, I was having a hard time hearing you before when you were making your statements about the insurance. Are you talking about unemployed people going on main care or some of them getting uh, their own private insurance? And if it's private insurance, uh, do you know how affordable those options are? Sure. So when I was speaking about health insurance, I was talking about all types of insurance. We have main care, which is Medicaid, which is generally for people with a family of four with income below about $36,000. We also have healthcare.gov, which is a portal for private insurance for people who have income that's higher than that, where they also can get some financial assistance. So you can get a premium tax credit to make that insurance more affordable if your income for a family of four is below $103,000. The governor's approach to coverage is we're all in. We don't care if you get public coverage or private coverage. We want you to have insurance. So if your child needs to see the doctor, your husband or wife needs to go see and go to an emergency room, or your older relative needs, needs some sort of intense care, that coverage is there for you. So we are advancing all sorts of coverage through CoverMe.gov. It's a one-stop shop to direct you to your affordable options. Great. Brad, you said you had a second question? Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Shaw, I just want to get your thoughts on uh, Dr. Fauci uh, warning the U.S. Senate today of unnecessary suffering and death uh, if the nation opens too soon. He's planning to address the Senate today. Sure. So, you know, Dr. Fauci in that particular situation was referring to states or municipalities that were moving ahead of what the White House's own criteria were. Uh, we in Maine are using uh, guidelines, guideposts that are remarkably similar. We're looking at the average number of cases over a rolling period. We're looking at the number of hospitalizations. We're looking at overall hospital preparedness. So, of course, if any institution, if any state were to move too quickly and get over their skis, there is a risk that there could be that secondary surge of cases. But based on the way that we're approaching things in Maine, uh, we feel that we're, we're proceeding stepwise as the data tells us and, and, and shines the light there. I guess in my own head, I, th I think of it, um, it it's, it's, it's the data that tell us how to do this, not the date that tells us how to do this. And so Dr. Fauci is undoubtedly correct. And I think it's a, a good reminder that we've really got to make sure we let the data be our guide in these situations. Okay, you bet. Uh, we're going to turn next to Dan Newman over at the Maine Beacon. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Shaw and one for uh, Commissioner Lambert as well. Um, Dr. Shaw, uh, the Department of Corrections website says they've only done um, 17 tests since the end of March. Um, given what we know about this, uh, how this uh, virus spreads in congregate setting and, uh, and given how we have more testing capacity right now, have you talked at all with um, DOC uh, about doing more spot testing? Mm -hmm. um, so Dan asks about testing in the Department of Corrections. Uh, and Dan, you're correct. The Department of Corrections uh, has a dashboard on their website that lists the current status of all of their testing activities. And we talk to the Department of Corrections literally every single day. Uh, they're a part of our briefings and have been since day one. Uh, there's always discussions that are going on about how we can keep any individual in congregate care settings safe. Uh, the Department of Corrections, I don't think, has made any final decisions on that, but we are discussing that with them. And certainly as they have individuals who are symptomatic, uh, I know that those individuals are tested. And as you know, thus far, they have not had any positive cases. And then you had a question for Commissioner Lambrew? Uh, yes. Um yeah, uh, Commissioner Lambrew, um, DHHS announced at the end of April it had submitted a request to the federal government to increase uh, reimbursement rates for direct care providers who workers uh, assist adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, has the federal government approved that request? So we did get approval for what was called our Appendix K uh, last week, which was very exciting. We also have uh, gotten approval for what's called the Medicaid Disaster Relief State Plan Amendment. So yes, we are. We have been working aggressively to ensure that the 
so the providers, especially in areas like these group homes that are dealing with adults with intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, have this temporary support so they can get the PPE, make sure that they can, uh, co you know, cordon off the different or cohort the different people in their facilities who may need it, might need to develop an alternative care site should there be an outbreak at these facilities. We have been working with these facilities for months alongside with assisted living and nursing facilities to ensure they as well have the support from the department. Okay, thanks, Dan. We're going to turn next to Ashley Blackford over at WAGM. I have a question for Dr. Shaw. Um, over in New Brunswick, they currently have 120 confirmed cases, 118 of which are reported as recovered. Why do you think the numbers are so much lower over there compared to here? Yeah, you know, it's a, Ashley, it's a, it's a good question. I, it's impossible to speculate. Uh, but I think the differences between population density uh, often make a big difference in transmission. Um, we see that at one extreme with very, very, very low density areas uh, and on the other extreme with very high density areas like New York City. So population density is a what we know from any infectious disease, a major driver. And when there's more space between people, whether it's COVID-19 or influenza or virtually any other infectious disease, the greater space, the, the less density there is, that turns out to be a protective factor. Um, we see the same thing potentially even in rural counties in Maine compared to the more densely populated counties. Uh, as to specifically why New Brunswick or any of the other provinces in that part of Canada, difficult to speculate. Um, I'm gonna turn next over to Caitlin Andrews at the BDN. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, I have a question for Commissioner Lambrew and then I have two for Dr. Shaw, please. Um, Commissioner, the provision allowing uninsured people to bill main care for testing, is that um, retroactive for uninsured folks and how long will that provision continue? Sure, it is retroactive to March 18th and it will continue through the declaration of a COVID public health emergency. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then, uh, Dr. Scott, uh, my first question is about the Tall Pines recovery. Um, is there a uniform way that these long-term care facilities are expected to track and report recoveries? And can you kind of talk more about what the um, what it means when there are no new cases? Like, do you see a possibility for people to lift visitation restrictions, or should they just kind of continue with business as usual? Sure. Okay. So, Caitlin asks about. Um, the road ahead for tall pines. So the first is with respect to recoveries. Uh, it's really more main CDC that, de that designates or deems when an individual patient or staff member has met the US CDC's criteria for recovery. Uh, again, that's what our contact tracers do as they continue to check in with patients and staff. So it's really, the, it's really main CDC that, that makes those designations. Um, and now in terms of the road ahead for tall pines, although again, it's 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 uh, it's positive news that there have not been any new cases at the facility in now 18 days. Um, the, the really for Tall Pines, it means that they've gotten back up to the status quo. It does not mean that visitation can be allowed or such things. What we want to do at this point is make sure that there is not a secondary spike in cases. We continue to be in touch with Tall Pines. We continue to make sure they've got PPE that they need. Uh, all, all uh, in service of trying to prevent the reintroduction of the virus in some way and causing yet another outbreak. Uh, so we're going to continue to work with Tall Pines, but unfortunately for those of you who are watching who might have family members who are residents there, uh, unfortunately this does not yet mean that, say, visitation can resume. Uh, it breaks my heart to have to say that, but we also know that we've got to keep residents in these facilities safe. Do you have a sense of what the recovery rate facilities are looking like? Um, you know what, uh, you, I know you've, you've, uh, you, you and Robert have chatted about that, and we are pulling those data. I believe we do have it or will soon have it. Um, in fact, let me see if I've, sorry, I may in fact have it. And yeah, while, we, while you're looking for that, I just would add one thing about visitation. One aspect of the emergency rules that we did uh, for all of our nursing facilities in Maine is both ensure the restrictions, but also require an ability for people to visit in a safe way. We want to make sure that every resident of a nursing facility can talk to and see their loved ones, be it through glass, 
through technology, through the phone. We really do feel as a two-way street, we both want to ensure their safety, but preserve and protect that you know, critical bond that our residents have with their families. Mm -hmm. and, and Caitlin, I, I do have it. Uh, and we did uh, tabulate the recovery rate, and this is for residents, not staff, but residents living in long-term care facilities, the recovery rate has been about 40%. That's to date. That will change as the outbreaks continue and more and more and more people be are deemed to be recovered. But that's what it stands at right now. Um, I, you bet. I'd like to turn over to Pat Callahan at News Center. Yes, Dr. Shaw, good afternoon. I want to dig a little deeper into what Dr. Fauci said today when he talked about vaccines and students going back to school. He was asked a question about college students returning to campuses and he had said the idea of having treatments or a vaccine to facilitate that by this fall would be something of a bridge too far is the vaccine the only thing that really matters here do you have any optimism that college students can return to campuses without a vaccine in place and have you been working with Maine's colleges to to try to come up with guidelines sure so pat asks about um the role of vaccines in returning to a number of congregate settings, in this case, into colleges and universities. Uh, the first, Pat, uh, you know, I think when Dr. Fauci used that term, a bridge too far, I think what he was referring to was the aggressive timeline that the senator was asking about and whether any such vaccine could be available by the fall. And I think that is what Dr. Fauci referred to as a bridge too far. In concept, he still believes that a vaccine is something that will be useful and vital. But in general, and I can't speak to colleges and universities specifically, similar to our discussion around uh, schools, there are a lot of stakeholders and a lot of discussions that have been had and will continue to be had um, in, in ways to try to move students back into colleges and in a safe manner. But here's what I'll say as a general matter. Vaccines, of course, are critical. But there are other non-pharmaceutical type in interventions that can be introduced in ways in any type of setting to try to, to make settings more safe. For example, we might have to think about staggering schedules in a way that we didn't really do before. So for example, the large lecture hall or a large congregate setting with tons and hundreds of different students, that might have to break into much smaller groups. We might have to have more classes throughout the day. So as previously, there may have been two 90 minute lectures per week. Maybe it will be smaller groups of lectures of just a handful of students. Uh, there might be, we might need to cohort students in a different way. So it's not a bunch of different students intermingling with one another, but rather a small group of just a handful of students who aren't exposed to different students in different ways. So I think the way that we go about these things from a, uh, a social administration standpoint will be different and different from we've, ways that we've ever thought about it. A vaccine will be helpful, but it won't be the only tool that we've got. Commissioner, did you want anything? Oh. Great. Um, thanks a lot, Pat. I'm going to turn things over to Steve Missler at Maine Public. Uh, thanks for taking the call. Uh, two quick questions for Commissioner Lambrew. Um, the first one's just a clarification on this. Um, on this guidance that may or may not come from the feds, um, but the state may adopt the ADA um, guidance on May, on May 18th, which I believe is Monday. Is that would that mean if you if you guys do go that route, that dentists could resume um, procedures, routine procedures that day? So to be precise, we know that um, the U.S. CDC said it will be updating its guidelines. Mm -hmm. It also, in response to the question from Senator Collins, Senator Collins laid out if they do this, if they, uh, if they closely track what's going on, if they adhere to strict protocols. She read some of the American Dental Association guardrails, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Redfield said, uh, yes, I would not disagree with those protocols. He didn't say, yes, mm -hmm. I endorse them. He <laughs> said, yes, I, won't, I don't disagree with them, and his guidelines will be coming soon. But in light of that, Maine would like to align our practices with other New England states. So beginning Monday 18th, we expect that, again, short of US CDC guidance coming out earlier, we would defer to the American Dental Association and the Maine Dental Association guidance. And that puts us not behind, but with other states. Connecticut is also um, doing the similar activity on May 20th, and Massachusetts is on Monday as well. 
Steve, did you, 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 did you have another Thanks question, Steve? I do, yeah, just a quick one. I just, um, and I have a quick follow-up to, to, for the commissioner and then a, a quick question for you, doctor. I guess the, I have, the question I have about the dentist and the, and the follow, this waiting for federal guidance, I'm just curious about why in that instance and not in others. And there was at least one other time when Maine CDC uh, broke away from federal guidance and that was on the prioritizing of testing in um, nursing homes, for example. Why in this instance, uh, did the state not break free of the federal guidance? Is it a, a is it a liability issue, or is there just something I'm missing? No, and I I want to I want to be careful about this answer because I think my my approach I like Dr. Shaw's view of this. Mm -hmm. We view our federal partners as setting minimums. They are able to look at the evidence, think through what it means for the state of Maine, but for all states. And when we're coming to the healthcare sector, which is really what we're talking about here, we've been focused at DHHS on healthcare businesses. DCD is, with our help, providing checklists. We are actually affirmatively saying, here's some good practices for you to reopen. But when it comes to healthcare, most healthcare organizations have infection control and prevention requirements. They have clinicians who are equally aligned with Maine CDC and DHS in promoting health, in protecting their workers and protecting their patients. So we didn't feel the need to advance those protections, especially when it would have been against a recommendation that US CDC said postpone non-urgent dental care. Mm -hmm. That gave us pause, but we're encouraged today by what we heard we look forward to seeing that US CDC guidance. And should that US CDC guidance not come out next week, we will go with the American Dental Association and Maine Dental Association guidance because we expect it will be aligned mm -hmm. given what we learned today. I'll add on top of that, Steve. I concur with Commissioner Wambrew. Generally, we look to the federal government to provide the floor, not the ceiling. Okay. In, the, in the situations that you've outlined, you noted that we have led the way on being more aggressive and progressive with our testing approach. That's because we went above the floor that the U.S. government set, whether it was for including congregate settings in our, test, in our tier one testing and some of the other examples we've talked about. To go the opposite way here would have mm -hmm. been to do the opposite. So we look to the federal government as the floor, not the ceiling. That's helpful. Thank you very much. And, and the last question I have for you, Dr. Shaw, is just about um, something that was said during the Senate hearing today um, by the Assistant Secretary of um, uh, USDHHS. Mm -hmm. He had indicated that states um, had submitted statements of need to, the, to help the feds get an idea of supplies, testing, and other materials that they might need as they reopen. Um, has Maine submitted one of those plans? Uh, and if so, can you give, maybe give a, a few highlights of what might be in it? Yeah, it's, um, I'm glad you raised that, Steve. We were keeping tabs on the hearing this morning, and um, I heard Dr. Giroir mention that. And um, it, we, we have, I want to be really clear, we have, since we began our activation, fulfilled every single request from the federal government for information as well as our needs. We've made specific requests to USDHHS as well as to FEMA to receive allotments, whether it be for testing supplies or of remdesivir, for example, today, or of testing kits. So we've made a number of, uh, of requests for testing supplies or requests for technical assistance, a lot of those things. Uh, Dr. Giroir used a term that, that my colleagues and I hadn't heard before, um, but, but I, I just want everyone to know that every single request that the U.S. government has made of us for information on what's going on in Maine, we have fulfilled. Every single request they've made for us of our testing capacity, our ability to treat patients, our number of ventilators, we've answered every single one of those. And we've also made separate requests for supplies, equipment, technical support. We can provide all of those for you. But to the specific document that he referenced, uh, I got to be candid with you, that's not a document that my counterparts or I had, had been familiar with. I think he was referring to, to be, to be straight with you, Steve, I think he was just referring to the request for assistance of FEMA or of HHS or CDC, of which we've made. Okay, so he, maybe he was talking um, in the aggregate, not a specific document. That was, when, when, we, when we heard that language from him, that is how my team and I interpreted that. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Yep, yep. Uh, we're going to turn next to Michael Fern at the main edge. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, first, quick question on how many cases are health care workers today? 
There are 323 health care workers today. Thank you. And you said earlier that 40% of long-term care uh, settings recovered, 60 did not. How many deaths or what percentage are from long-term care? Um, as, of, as of this morning, um, of, the, of the cases in long-term care facilities, there has unfortunately been a 14% mortality rate among those. Thank you. Hmm? You bet. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we're and the last question today goes to Patrick Whittle from the Associated Press. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, we uh, we heard yesterday that there were um, there were outbreaks reported at group homes for people with disabilities. I'm I'm, I'm wondering if there's any kind of an update to be provided about about where we are now with that and with preventing it in the future. And also, if Commissioner Lambrew could uh, talk a little bit more about um, the, uh, the the better availability of testing. I think I believe I heard that testing was going to be made free and available in the future. I just want to make sure I have that straight. Okay. Uh, I'll start, Patrick. So of the, of the outbreaks that we discussed yesterday, one at Granite Bay Care in Brunswick, Residential Community Support Services, um, and then uh, the Maple House in Spurwink, there have been no changes in the case numbers. Three at the Granite Bay Care, three at the Maple House in Spurwink, and four at Residential Community Support Services, and no changes in those numbers since yesterday. Sure. And on group homes, we have, in the same way we surveyed nursing facilities and surveyed assisted living facilities, we're now in the field surveying our group homes to identify their needs, their challenges, their practices, so we can then target interventions. We recently held a town hall meeting with group homes to give them best you know, advice on how to protect themselves and as needed, we'll continue. We will not stop working with all of our congregate living facilities until we feel as though they on their own can keep their residents safe. And on your testing announcement question, so we have to yesterday announced that we are now going to pay for through Maine Care for testing and diagnostics of COVID-19 for uninsured people in Maine, irrespective of their income. We already announced that we're covering such testing through Maine Care. There's a private insurance order that was issued earlier this year to ensure private insurance covers those tests and Medicare itself covers those diagnostics and testing for COVID-19. So with that, all residents of Maine will have some source of coverage for COVID-19. And I might add with a note of privilege to add on to the National Nurses Week. We are so proud of the 160 nurses who work at the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for that. We also named one of our flagship psychiatric centers in the state, state of Maine after Dorothea Dix. Mm -hmm. The people who work at Dorothea Dix Psychiatric Center in Bangor, Maine, live on in their mission, in their compassion, in their quality care for people with mental illness, as well as people who are disadvantaged. I thank them as well in this National Nurses Week. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please take, be kind, take care of one another. We'll talk tomorrow.